We're beginning a new sermon series uh, titled Hope in the Storm, a gospel-centered perseverance. For the next couple of months, we'll be taking a look at what Christ provides and calls us to when we experience things in life that are difficult and possibly even discourage us from clinging to Jesus for all things. The gospel is not something that we are merely given, but it provides us with an identity, a purpose, and strength in the saving work of Jesus to persevere and even grow in the storms of life. And so over the next two months, as we spend time in God's word, I hope that it's very both convicting and encouraging to you as the Spirit stirs our hearts and minds to walk faithfully after Christ in all things. Today's word comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 26, and we'll be reading verses 36 through 46. Matthew, chapter 26, and we'll be reading verses 36 through 46. And when you are there, wherever you are, will you rise with me to honor God's word? This is the word of the Lord from Matthew 26, verses 36 through 46. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass, unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Amen. The word of the Lord. Join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we approach your throne of sovereignty and peace, would you humble us at this time? Would you help the distractions to melt away before the majesty of who you are? And Lord, would you uh, not only draw us near in the moving of your spirit, but would you convict our hearts and would you compel us, Father, to a deepening and a widening of faithful obedience and surrender to you? Humble me at this time as well and would you help me to hide behind the cross? And Lord, that the words you speak through your servant would be something that is not only encouraging but also transformative as that is what you do and that is who you are. And it's in your name we pray, amen. It's such a harmless question, isn't it? Are you okay? We use it as a greeting and throw it at one another without really even waiting for the answer often because we just assume that, yes, things are okay. But what if we are not okay? From a social perspective, can you imagine that you're walking down one of these very long hallways and corridors here at the church building and you see someone coming towards you and you throw out as a greeting, in passing, are you okay? And they stop you gently by putting their hand on your arm and they say, I'm not okay. I don't know what I believe in anymore. I don't know if things will ever be okay. My wife doesn't love me. My children are lost. I am not okay. What do I do? Some of you feel a little awkward right now because that's not what's supposed to happen in the social interaction. This throws a wrench in the simple uh, greeting that we offer when we say, are you okay? And they're actually, in our minds, ruining the moment and making it awkward and difficult. But the truth is that especially now in the aftermath of the last nine months with COVID, stay at home, political and social unrest, kids working on schoolwork at home through Zoom and parents having to struggle how to divide and multiply again through this new math nonsense that they're doing, 
When you couple that with finances and budgets and business and work, shelter in place, the inability to gather in person, the inability to even see our friends, and the constant, seemingly constant negativity we hear on the news, the truth is that many of us are not okay. And if we look deeper than the difficult reality that we are not okay, we don't know how to respond to others, much less ourselves, in the admission that we are not okay. And thinking about it, we may harbor shame, frustration, maybe even anger, and many other feelings that expose our inner frailty and brokenness behind the public masks that we put on, especially in the Asian culture, the exterior, thing, the, the exterior things that we show to one another to pretend that we are fine and everything is going okay. In times of storm or struggle, we are not good at persevering well in Christ. And we struggle to just scrape by and barely survive on our own power, if we have any at all. And so I ask us again, as a gathering of the broken yet beloved people of Jesus Christ, how does Christ call us to live faithfully when we are not okay? In our text today, I wonder how Jesus would have responded to this if you asked him, hey Jesus, are you okay? And the privilege of the word of God is that he tells us, After the final Passover dinner with the disciples, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, the sons of Zebedee, and they go almost a mile outside of Jerusalem to the Garden of Gethsemane. And as they get there, almost as if on cue, as if they had asked him, Jesus, are you okay? Jesus tells them, he says, my soul, and notice his wording even here, not I, but my soul, the very essence of his deepest identity in heart and being. Jesus says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. And that's a loaded word, especially if you go into the New Testament Greek. That word that Jesus uses for sorrow is sadness, struggle, anguish, and unimaginable suffering. So it's not just I had a bad day or I had a bad week or a bad nine months. Jesus says, the very essence of my existing in my soul, my being, is an anguish and suffering. I'm overwhelmed by sorrow almost to the point of death. And he says to his beloved disciples, stay here with me. And that phrase, especially in the Greek, is also loaded because what he's actually saying to them is love me, be with me here fully in your presence, guard me, pray with me, and protect me. I can see the disciples' faces frozen an impotent shock, their mouths open and not knowing what to do. What could they do for Jesus, the one who had driven out demons, the one who heals the lame and the blind and the sick, the one who raised Lazarus from the dead, the one who walked on water, the one who calmed the storms by simply saying to them, you're annoying to me, be quiet. What could they possibly do and for what could they possibly do for Jesus at this time? The torment of his soul that Jesus is experiencing is because of what lies before him in the cup of wrath. The cup of wrath of God's righteousness against our human vanity and sin that Jesus was called to take for our redemption and salvation. It's the very sacrifice that only he could suffer through and endure for us in our eternal communion with God. You see, Jesus is torn apart with himself because of the cost and excruciating horror and pain that he will have to endure on the cross for the love of his people, especially for sins that he himself did not commit. Jesus is tormented and struggling in the very depths of his soul, and more than any other person in history, Jesus is not okay. Christ continues to walk a bit further from them, shakily lifting one foot in front of the other, even more lonely in the fact that even though his disciples are with him, there is nothing that they can do for him, and they don't even fully begin to understand what he is facing alone. And what does this Jesus do when he's not okay? Jesus prays. And in some ways, this is so satisfactory, and in other ways, it's almost frustrating because the answer and the first impulse of Jesus Christ and his actions in prayer is something that we 
secretly are hoping that there was more to. But, more, but most importantly, Jesus' first response in his anguish and his soul being overwhelmed is to turn to his Father in prayer. More importantly, Jesus models for us the faithful response of a disciple who is in the midst of a storm. Jesus reveals how we are able to respond when all seems to be hopeless, that we can, we should, and we must turn to God in prayer. In his anguish, Jesus prays to the Father, Father, it's me, your son. Listen, if there's any possibility or any imaginable way that I don't have to take this cup and drink it, If I don't absolutely have to go through this, then I ask that this cup be taken from me. Let it pass. I do not want to do this. I don't want to go through the unspeakable horrors that lie before me. Father, please let this pass. At this point, Luke describes Jesus praying with such agony and desperation that he begins to shake and tremble as the sweat poured from his body. But also in the midst of this heart-wrenching moment, Luke tells us that Jesus was not alone. That an angel from heaven came to strengthen Jesus in his moment of weakness. That the presence of God had fallen upon him to comfort him, to be with him, and to give him strength. God hears, God knows, and God is with his son. You see, Jesus isn't rebelling against God's desire when he asks for this cup to pass. He's expressing his personal human anguish, his sorrow, his fear. He's expressing to his heavenly Father, whom he loves and whom he knows loves him, that this is the state of my heart and my life and mind right now. And after sharing his heart, Jesus reaffirms and resubmits to God's will for him by saying, yet ultimately, no matter what happens, even though you know my heart and you know what I'm asking you, ultimately, not my will be done, Father, but yours. Whatever you call me to do, I will do. Later, Jesus returns for a second and third time to pray and lay down his troubled heart before God. But in these later times, the second and third time, his prayer is slightly different than the first plea of mercy that he begs of the Father. He says in the second and third prayers, Father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken from me, if it's going to happen, if the only way that your people can be cleansed and redeemed is for me to take this cup and drink it, then I won't ask you to change your mind. Your will be done and not mine. Will you strengthen me and empower me to walk in obedience to your will? Did you notice the shift in Jesus' prayer from the first to the second and third time? In his first prayer, Jesus asked the Father to take it away, to make the pain stop, to, take, to, to end his suffering, his anguish, and his overwhelming sense of doom. And yet, in the second and third prayer, as he continues to come before God, there is a shift, there's a strengthening, and there's this moving to obedience of God's will. Jesus doesn't ask for the cup to pass. Jesus doesn't ask that God change his will. Jesus says, your will be done. You know all. You know where I'm at. And if this is still what you call me to, I know that you will walk with me through it. Will you strengthen me? Where the disciples struggle to even pray or physically stay awake to keep company and guard their Lord who they had time and time again sworn to be faithful to, Jesus clings to communion with the Father in prayer as a source of hope, of strength and joy. The Father not only hears his son, but he strengthens him to take on what he must for us. When Jesus is not okay in the midst of the storm, he commits himself to the Father in prayer, who hears, is present with, and strengthens his son to persevere through all things, even death on a cross. So what does this mean for us today? Well, there are three things that I want to point out and share with us as we reflect on God's word. And the first thing is this, prayer is the lifeline that helps us endure in the storm and all of life. Prayer is the lifeline that helps us endure in the storm and all of life. More than the Christian or the cliche Christianese advice of just pray, prayer is the means by which we are known, heard, and strengthened by God. And, by pray- and prayer is also the means by which we can know ourselves 
hear and obey God in all circumstances. It's a two-way road. It's the call and response that we have at worship. In the beginning, we, we begin with God's word calling us to worship and we respond with songs of praise, with prayer, with a confession of our faith. God speaks to us directly in his word in the preaching of the gospel and then we respond with a song of praise. Prayer is the means by which we are known, heard, and strengthened by God and by which we can know, hear, and obey God in all circumstances. So in other words, by this biblical gospel truth, if we are not praying, we cannot know and obey God. And if we are not praying, we will not be known and God will not strengthen us after his image. I find it fascinating and convicting that in his anguish and soul-shaking suffering, the first impulse Jesus has is to turn to the Father in prayer. In fact, Hebrews 5, 7 through 9, points this out to the faithful and encourages them, this is what we are called to do. Hebrews 5, 7 through 9 says this, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears, meaning that Jesus prayed not only when it was a blessing, but especially when it was difficult and, and there was much suffering to be had. To him who was able to save him from death, and he, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Jesus spoke through prayer to the Father, even as a part of the triune Godhead. Jesus submitted in humility to the Father, even as part of the same triune Godhead. Further, scripture is full of examples where God's people turn to him in prayer, out of, especially out of anguish and difficulty. Psalm 130, just one out of the many in the midst of the Psalms, Psalm 130 says, out of the depths I cry out to you, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. Jonah prays to God from not only the depths of the ocean, but from the depths of a fish. David writes psalms and prays as he hides from Saul in caves. The entirety of the book of Lamentations is about honest and raw crying out in desperation and prayer for God's redemption to come to his people. Paul worshiped and prayed to God even while he was beaten and chained in prison. And brothers and sisters, there are so many more instances where the frailty of humanity enduring storms, the first response was to turn to God in prayer. Prayer or communion and talking with God is not a license to complain just to complain. It is the freedom and privilege to share our hearts with a loving Father, with the hope of placing our burdens at the feet of the cross and submitting to God as he strengthens us in his presence. It is like a child running to the father and losing ourselves in his arms. If you've ever gone to a playground or if you have children, you know that while the children are playing, if a parent shows up, most of the time, the child will run to the parent and give them a hug to touch base. Psychologically, we talk about touching, we, we call it touching base, where in the midst of their play, they want to take a moment and pause and touch base with their parent to make sure that they're secure and then they have the freedom to go back and play. And as I was learning this in college in my psych classes, it was fascinating that not only did ch children turn and run to their parents when they fell and bruised their knee or got into an argument with another student, but children also ran to their parents when they were having fun in the middle of a game. But the point is that we have the privilege and freedom to run to our Heavenly Father in prayer, not only when it's good, but especially when it's bad, God desires us and calls us to come before him to realize that in his love, it's okay to not be okay on our own because ultimately you and I are incapable of being fine, even barely okay of our own being in our brokenness and vulnerability. Our hope is that in faith, in Christ, we will be okay by his cross, which means victory over sin and death for us. The joy is that this victory is not only eternal, but here for us now in our lives today. The hope is, that, is not that our struggles and storms will magically disappear, 
but that we are strengthened in the fact that God walks with us even through the storms and in the valleys in hearing, knowing, and strengthen us, strengthening us for his glory and our good. The point, the point of prayer is not to change God, but to change us, to transform us into the will, the image, and the wisdom of God. Prayer changes us in realigning our perspective from being separate and apart and fixed and focused only on our suffering or our own brokenness back to the wisdom and the righteousness of who God is. The point of prayer is not to change God, but to change us. The astounding grace of gospel-centered prayer is not that we can pray as finite humans before an infinite God. I mean, that's a blessing and that's a great and astounding thing, but the astounding grace of gospel-centered prayer is that God even allows us to call out to him and to call him Father as those who are unfaithful and sinful, even in the most deepest forms of our wretched states of disobedience. This is grace, and this is a blessing for those who are unworthy of it. And not only does God allow us to call out to him in prayer and to call him Father, but he hears, he is with, and he answers us with himself. It's not just that we pray and everything will be fine, We are called to pray in all things, in all seasons, and in all times in order that we would submit all things to his sovereignty and grace and that more importantly, perhaps, we would submit ourselves, ourselves to God's wisdom and righteousness to strengthen and carry us through all things. The second point I would like to to give us today is this. We must pray with and for one another to share the burden the burdens of life as a body. What's interesting here is that Jesus takes Peter, James, and John with him and he begins to be sorrowed and troubled in their presence. And he even confesses to them, this is the state of my soul, that he is overwhelmed, sorrowful, and he asks them to stay and keep watch over him. Now, I understand that Peter, James, and John are pretty big disciple names, but if you actually look at the roster of disciples, Peter, James, and John are among those who caused Jesus the most sorrow, frustration, and anger in the books of the Gospels. They are arrogant, loud. They think, or they act before they think, and actually they have this arrogance and pride where they vied to be the so-called best disciple, and yet this is the community that Jesus calls to himself. And this is the community that Jesus surrounds himself with. This speaks volumes to the type of love and relationship rooted in God's love, agape, and sacrifice that we are to have towards each other in the body of Christ. We must not only, one, be willing to humbly and wisely share our burdens, our struggles, and our prayer requests with one another, but we must also be willing to go and to seek out and ask and walk with one another in prayer and intercession, especially as part of the body of Christ, especially within the fellowship of the church. It's not up to Peter, James, and John to fix the problem or even make Jesus feel better, but what he's actually calling them to do is for them to be present, to have their identity, to have their bodies, to have their voices crying out in intercessory prayer around Jesus, comfort him and strengthen him in encouragement to pray with and for one another, to carry the burden. How are we asking and holding accountable and walking with one another in prayer? That's a difficult question in itself, but if I continue to challenge us in love, I would ask that question with the addition of this. How are we asking, holding accountable, and walking with one another in prayer beyond simple social ties and so-called Christian fellowship? If someone came to you and asked you as a friend or as someone that you walk with in community, how's your spiritual walk with Christ going? Is that immediately met with awkwardness and a look of what are you doing right now? You and I talk about sports and celebrity gossip and news, not the state of my soul. There's a problem. 
If when we gather in fellowship as the church right after Sunday service or when we have men's groups or women's groups or whatever it might be, when we even gather for coffee with our Christian brothers and sisters and the idea of humbly and wisely opening up our hearts and sharing the concerns that we have in trusting love as Christ calls us to, if that's a problem, then what we have is not fellowship of the body. It's the same thing as anything else that the world offers. How are we praying with and for one another wherever and whenever we gather together? The second question to this is, how are we praying both with and for, specifically as God calls us, for our spouses, our children, the neighbors, for the church, for the cities and nations of the world? Because biblically speaking, we are specifically and explicitly called to pray for these people and things and places and powers by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you pray with and for your spouse? Do you pray with and for your children? Do you pray with and for the church, et cetera, et cetera, in the spheres of influence and calling that God has placed you in? No matter whether you're a student in college or a young adult that's unemployed or a powerful CEO at some Silicon Valley tech company, we are all given an opportunity and a calling in a sphere of influence to humbly pray and engage in fellowship under the cross of Christ. For if we are not praying with and for the people that God has placed in our lives, it's not just laziness, but we are being disobedient to what Christ models, we are disobedient to how Christ loves us, and we are being disobedient to what the gospel calls and commands us to do. How are we praying with and for one another? And the third point is tied with the second point, but how are we persevering in keeping watch over our hearts and one another in prayer. You know, if we look at the story of what happens in Matthew 26, the disciples struggle because they place the importance and value of sleep over the fatigue of their physical and human bodies over what their so-called Lord, Savior, and King calls them to. And this is the dichotomy of brokenness in the gospel, isn't it? With their lips, when it's easy, they say, I will never forsake you, I will forgo through the mountain for you. I will always be there for you. And when Jesus not only calls them and asks them desperately for their support, for their fellowship and prayer, when Jesus specifically is vulnerable and confesses that he is overwhelmed in his soul with anxiety and suffering, they are unable to persevere and keep watch over their Lord and Savior. You see, so often we think that prayer is just something that we kind of whisper to God for four seconds before we quickly eat or sit down and do once in a while when we remember in between Netflix binges. But biblically in the gospel, prayer is the avenue by which we walk with God daily. Not when we are desperate, not as a last resort, not when we feel like it, but prayer is the fellowship of walking with and talking with and communion, having communion with God daily in and through all things. We can so easily resonate with the disciples as they wrestle with the physical world and literally fall asleep. And we make excuses that we are busy, that we're tired, and that we have all these other things that take precedence or are more important than the simple call of Jesus to simply follow him in obedience. As if Jesus is not Lord over those things as well. Beloved of Christ, we must be vigilant and take great faithful care to stay awake, to persist, to persevere in being the presence of grace and humility for one another in intercessory prayer and support as he cares for and guards us in the spirit. A full Christian life doesn't mean that we have to be okay at all times with fake smiles painted on our faces or live life without any struggles as we are able to overcome all things and do all things on our own, for the truth is we can't. A full Christian life, especially in prayer, means that in all things, in all circumstances, that we can tell Jesus about where we are, what the state of our heart and our soul and our mind is, and learn to trust in him that in all things, he not only is with us and that he knows, but that he walks with us and strengthens us. And as we persist faithfully in prayer, as we persist faithfully in obedience and in surrender to the cross and Christ as Lord and King, 
that he will not only walk with us and know us and hear us and strengthen us, but that he will continue to make us more and more into his image and righteousness by the Spirit. That we understand that our God is a God who loves and longs to hear our praises and adoration, as well as our struggle and our complaints, so that he may continue to teach us out of his love. We must learn to prayerfully wait on God to keep vigilantly vigilantly awake in God's promise to watch with Jesus, even to death on the cross, so that we may have life in him. Beloved of Christ, our Father hears and sees us. Jesus knows and Jesus has already won. So let us prayerfully keep watch and walk after him as we trust his perfect and good love for us. And let us continue to prayerfully persevere, not only with God in the vertical relationship that we have with him, but also with one another in the horizontal relationship of the body of Christ. Are you okay? I'm not. But because of Jesus in faith, we will be. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you model and show us directly something that we may all know, but that we all all so incredibly easily forget. Would you forgive us for our arrogance, for our stubbornness, and for our inability to remember who you are as our King and Lord? And Lord, would you beckon to us again in the sweetness of your love? Would you not only convict in the spirit, but would you compel us to surrender, to action, and to obedience? And as you we're in the Garden of Gethsemane and you confessed your heart to you, the Father. Help us to, Father, also respond to you that ultimately, no matter what may come in prayer, that not our will but yours be done and help us to trust in you and help us to walk after you, not only as individuals but together as your body and your people that you have called. And it's in your very powerful name we pray. Amen.